everyone. I think we will get started and people will trickle in. Uh, welcome to our fourth Liftoff In Motion speaker series. My name is Mara Leff and I'm the Director of Innovation for the Jewish Healthcare Foundation and the Director of Liftoff PGH 2020, a first of its kind healthcare innovation summit uh, taking place this December uh, in Pittsburgh. Liftoff officially launched uh, last January as our bold step towards propelling Pittsburgh into the future um, of, of healthcare and into a global leadership position in the field. Over the past year, uh, along with some incredible team members and, and members of the community, we have worked to build a coalition of local organizations who have shared our vision of transformational change and we are proud to have partners from across uh, sectors, including the technology and startup world, the healthcare industry, education and entrepreneurship uh, areas. We have engaged students in our Ideathon pitch competition and summer entrepreneurship boot camp. We have joined forces with Innovate PGH and the Pittsburgh Innovation District to amplify the region's identity as a hub for life sciences, innovation and ingenuity. And we have recruited some of the brightest minds from near and far to share stories uh, of disruption with us. And we didn't want to wait until December to bring you inspirational content. So we launched Liftoff in Motion, which is our series this summer, to shine a light on local ingenuity in the face of a pandemic. Our goal with Liftoff is to not only highlight uh, the unprecedented response to crisis, but also to ask what does the future of Pittsburgh's healthcare innovation landscape look like after COVID and, and how do we get there? So when we started planning tonight's event, I could think of no other person that I wanted to join us as a moderator than Kenny Chen, who has been a longtime partner. He is always thinking towards the future while constantly evaluating what these big shifts mean for the future of all of us. And he, he truly takes the long view. So Kenny is a leader in the Pittsburgh technology community. He's passionate about developing artificial intelligence for social good. He started Pittsburgh AI as a grassroots organization to make AI more accessible to people throughout the city. And he also co-founded PART, the Partnership to Advance Responsible Technology, a nonprofit think tank that works with local and international partners to advise on AI policy and strategy. Kenny has championed Pittsburgh across the globe. I can say I've seen it. And, and he has led the city's participation in a variety of initiatives, including uh, the UN AI for Good Summit, X Prize competitions, AI Commons, City AI, uh, and, and the amazing AI triangle partnership between Pittsburgh, Boston, and Montreal. So we are thrilled to have Kenny with us. And for, with that, I'm gonna turn it over and Kenny will introduce our esteemed speaker for tonight. So thank you for being with us. All right, Mara, thank you so much. And uh, not just you, but the entire uh, JHF team, everyone on the Liftoff Advisory Group, who's been bringing together this kind of community and um, helping us launch and look towards the, the future. Um, I've really enjoyed the Liftoff Motion series so far uh, with epistemics and the School of Public Health. Also, you know, our good friend Gal Imbar from, from last time and look forward to you know, the continued series going on. And I so appreciate the chance to join you today and have this conversation with a friend and personal inspiration um, and hero of mine, really, uh, Dr. Po Shen Lo, um, who, who we know and love um, as, you know, this polymathic individual within uh, the, the city, you know, CMU math professor, uh, national coach of the U.S. Math Olympiad team, but also a serial social entrepreneur with um, not just XP, uh, the social enterprise learning platform, um, making, you know, math and science education fun around the world, um, but, you know, also uh, the launch of Novid that we're going to get into, as well as Poe's personal work in educating and inspiring uh, math and students around the world with um, the daily challenge with Potion Low and Ask Math Anything, uh, uh, along with 
you know, plenty of other brilliant, wonderful things that, that he leads. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Poe since 2014, very soon after I moved to Pittsburgh, and since then um, have just enjoyed seeing his work uh, grow, whether through X Prize competitions or through these kinds of pursuits in responding to uh, the global challenges that we're facing right now. And um, yeah, you know, I'm I'm just excited to launch into this. So so Poe. Um, you know, I don't know if any introduction can to you, do you justice, so I'm, I'm going to um, run this over and say, how are you? And, you know, tell us a bit about um, how you've been during this roller coaster of a year, and how has 2020 been a bit different from um, some of the previous years that, that have come by? Oh, good gracious. Well, first of all, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I love, I love being in this community. And actually, seeing all these other people here, I even saw some people on the participant list. There are a lot of inspiring people around here. Now, um, how has my year been? Well, what, what is today? Today is the 14th of July. So under, nor under normal circumstances, I'm usually at the International Mathematical Olympiad at this time because I'm the national coach of the U.S. Yeah. team. Uh, but, you know, I, Facebook always tells you, here's your memory of what happened last year. And indeed, I was last year, where was I? I was somewhere in England. But this year, I'm obviously not somewhere in England because uh, the COVID-19 pandemic came. I never saw this coming. Um, what, what, if I wanted to say what I was doing recently over the last year, I had been doing the work I do at Carnegie Mellon. I'd been building our website XP for, uh, for learning. I always go back and forth. I used to always go back and forth to Asia about every two months with math education types of outreach. And I came back from Asia to the United States on January 1st, 2020. Obviously that was in the middle of winter break. So that's why I went over. I came back to the US and I had just heard some news about some new virus that emerged. And I, came to me, you know, because that was, I had just flown back from China. So I heard, oh, interesting, something had happened. I didn't know it was going to be this big. And indeed, I was following most of my things as normal. I took the United States team to, a to an international math contest at the end of February. And on the plane as we were going there, we saw all these people wearing masks because the flight was in, uh, in the south of Europe. And I was thinking to myself, wow, people seem to be taking this thing kind of seriously. A week later, all flights from Europe were canceled to the U.S., right? So, so I basically got back to the U.S. with one week to spare. But I just didn't, I didn't see all this coming. And then suddenly in the middle of March, uh, a lot of meetings that I was going to in the U.S. got canceled. That's when I was thinking. At that time, I said, my plan is I've been working in education. I've been working in online education. This is my, uh, my hope now is to go and help everyone through online education. But then those plans got, that, got completely turned around on a, a, on a Saturday in the middle of March. I don't know which date that was, 15th probably? But in any case, on that particular day, a message went out to, all, to many of the members of what's called the Hertz Foundation Fellows Community. I happen to be what is called the Hertz Foundation Fellow. And the Hertz Foundation finds 15 people every year across the entire US, across all fields combined, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, and after some interviewing and finding these 15 people, they provide them with a free PhD in exchange for agreeing that if there's ever a moment of national crisis, you'll come to help. So I'm one of these guys. And the idea was, this whole thing was founded, by the way, in the 1960s at the height of the Cold War when the United States wasn't sure if we'd need a second Manhattan Project uh, to bring scientists together. We were never brought together to build bombs. None of us thought we would be. But instead, what happened is we got rallied because uh, of COVID-19. And so when I was getting ready to go for online education, the call came and it said, well, COVID-19 is a national crisis. Actually, it's an international crisis. Maybe see if you can step up. And that's when I started thinking about this. And that's what led to Novid. A day, a day later, actually, the story is that I didn't know what to do. I'm a mathematician. Um, what, what, what would I do? Model something? I guess that's still useful, by the way. But a day later, I was reading the PhD thesis of my uh, PhD student. And at the second sentence of the introduction, it just hit me like a flash. My area of research, which is called network theory, is actually fundamental. It's, it can be a fundamental step towards controlling the spread of COVID-19. I came up with the idea for an app called Novid, which we maybe will talk a little bit about. But as soon as I got that idea, I just had to do it. And you know, I ran downstairs, I told my wife, I was like, would you install an app that did, 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 did? And she was like, yeah, I, I think I would. And I said, okay, then we got to do it. And the rest is history. Now my whole life is running around trying to stop COVID-19. That's, that's amazing. And, and Paul, we, we are definitely going to dig um, deep into Novid. I, I think a lot of the audience here is very interested in learning more about that. But I want to get a bit more into some of that background that led up to this and, you know, 
how you kind of casually mention that you're part of this like Justice League or Adventure uh, Avengers group, um, it really gives me a bit more hope and optimism for humanity, knowing that there is you know individuals like you and other brilliant minds around the world that are uh, you know working towards the benefit of of humanity and society. Um, so can you just tell us a bit about um, you know, what led you to even come to Pittsburgh and be this kind of uh, force for, for good within our city and uh, leading towards the work that you're doing now? Oh, sure. So I was attracted to Pittsburgh because of the talent. So I, I should say, for me, I, I like building things. I like being part of contributing. And I also like working hard. And I like really talented people. And so uh, when I was considering what I might want to do for a job someday, uh, I, well, one of the things I wanted to do was maybe work at a university where there might be access to students who, if you gave them really hard homework, would say, thank you. <laughs> it's a little bit unusual, but you know, there, 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 are, there are some universities like Carnegie Mellon where if it's too easy, the students will say, come on, come on, that's all you're going to give me? Uh, and so, so, so that's what I wanted to be around. I wanted to be around that kind of uh, person who would just inspire me and, and force me to do more. So I, I, I really was very intrigued by Carnegie Mellon University. Actually, I even applied to come here when I was in high school, um, but somehow because of various financial reasons, I went elsewhere. But then because of Carnegie Mellon University being in Pittsburgh and because of the culture of not just the university, but the surrounding, uh, the surrounding city of a work hard, do great things, build stuff uh, culture, I said, I I'd like to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. That's that's awesome. And I, I can imagine that's also part of what uh, drove you to build XP and now Novid, you know, within Pittsburgh as well, um, rather than any of the other kind of numerous places around the world that you have access to. Oh, yes. Uh, actually, uh, when, I, when I came up with that idea in the middle of March and realized that what we needed to build is some kind of an app that will do this anonymous contact tracing, I, it immediately flashed through my head, this is the best place to do it. I mean, this happens to have, we happen to have access to some world-class designers. Uh, we have access to world-class engineers. We have very hardworking people in general. Actually, what we're doing now is not just technical. We also have to do uh, outreach and all kinds, of other kind, all, all kinds of other positions. And so I was very happy to be here. I feel that this is a place where innovation can happen. And by being in, being in the startup world here in Pittsburgh for the last six years, I'm very happy to be here. And I, I, I expect to just continue to be trying to build uh, whatever innovations I happen to be involved with here. Mm -hmm, definitely, and then we're really glad to have you here. And uh, so, you know, let's let's jump right into it with um, with Novid. And um, you know, as uh, as happy as I am uh, to be here with you, and you know, enjoying this this kind of a conversation, we we are convening in some pretty. Um, uh, dire and severe circumstances. You know, the last time I checked, um, the, the global uh, count for COVID cases exceeded 13,500,000, you know, close to 600,000 deaths. And I wish I could say that the U.S. Um, was, uh, was doing a good job of it, but we're past three and a half million um, or, or more cases ourselves, um, inching up towards 140,000 um, uh, deaths. And you know you've been in the thick of this global response process um, since very early on. Um, you know you mentioned getting that Hertz um, Foundation call back in March. Um, what do you see in terms of how the global to you know national and local spread of COVID responses is is shaping up as right now? And what really stands out to you from the position that you're in as somebody developing a solution? Yeah, I'll say that unfortunately the, the system, I mean, the situation doesn't look great. Uh, I, I mean, I'm also a mathematician. As I joked at the beginning, mathematicians can model things. And the problem with COVID is it's based on exponential growth. Exponential growth is the idea that things double in roughly the same amount of time. But this is also counterintuitive to many people. For example, some people are surprised and they say, how could it be that we, we went from 10,000 cases to 20,000 cases in the same amount of time it took to go from 10 cases to 20 cases? I mean, when I say it this way, it, at first someone's like, well, look at that, you just got 10,000 cases in the time it took to get 10 cases. 
Well, yes, but the critical piece was it was multiplicative. It was like you double, it takes the same amount of time to double. And so the problem is when you try to control the spread of something that's exponential in a way which is very reactive, I think unfortunately that's what we're seeing. When you try to control something in a reactive way, when the ICUs in Houston are almost full and you stop it, then very shortly thereafter they get completely full and then people are left on the sidewalk, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the problem. And, and so what I see is that uh, we need to have ways to provide everyone with more information to help people make better decisions for themselves. So notice I've said it this way. Actually, if I look at the range of responses, we've seen some responses which are quite top down. And to be honest, some of those have actually worked. But then the question of course that is asked is, is it a worthwhile sacrifice <laughs> in the sense that, you know, you could have everything be run top down. Or the question is, can, it, can there be something which preserves this individual choice, which also preserves health, right? And so when I look at this range of responses, we have, we have some countries which use more top down, some countries which are more anyone do anything. And I think actually what we need is we need to have some way, if we want to have something where many people exert their own choice, at least give them more information. And that was actually what gave me the idea for Novid because I was watching, as, as I mentioned, I do work across in Asia and in the US. And as I was watching all of this, I was thinking, is there a way to bring all the benefits that come from a coordinated top down system to a uh, grassroots everybody making their own decision system and the conclusion i came to was well yes there is if you can equip every individual with that information that they need that otherwise would only be centralized mm -hmm. and that's that's a fascinating point and it what really stands out to me um uh both in terms of my personal uh response and experience with covid and what i know to be the case for so many others is this overwhelming feeling of powerlessness and helplessness as you know this virus um whether it was in january and february as we saw it you know happen from afar and then as it's come you know over from our end um this sense of not being able to address international or national policy not being able to uh play a role within the kind of public health decisions of a state or, or even a city, you know, what can an individual do beyond um, put on a mask and stay home, uh, maintain social distancing protocols? And, you know, I, I feel like um, part of your story um, coming from a similar place of questioning your ability of um, being able to contribute, finding a solution, but then also creating a solution that puts some power back in people's hands to take some control of, um, of, of navigating this um, dangerous space within their own lives is, is really compelling to me. So I'd love for you to you know, take, take a few minutes uh, to go through and explain to anyone who hasn't gone on the Novid website, checked out the app, you know, how, does the, how does the app work? Um, what do people really need to understand about um, its, its functions, how easy it is to use, and what kind of impact it can have on their lives as well as the lives of the people around them whom they care about. Wow, well, thank you very much, Kenny. I'd love to say a little bit about this. So the way we started this was with the insight that if you gave everybody information to make their own choices better, then everyone is safer. And so the, the core design principle for Novid was how to make it something that the average person would actually find directly useful. And for that, let me just share a screen to like a, to an image that really describes the, the purpose of what we're trying to do here. So if you see this, uh, this happens to be a, a, a chart. And this chart summarizes one of the major value propositions that the, that the app has. Can you see a chart with some red bars? Yeah, okay, great. So this, this chart is supposed to represent how far away COVID cases are from you. And the way to read this degree of connection across the bottom is that you is you. One is representing how many positive COVID cases there are among people that you are in the same room with on a typical two week basis. So, I mean, if you go back over to the last two weeks and see who you typically spend time with, uh, or one would be all the people who you actually are in the same room with. The two is representing people that you you don't spend time in the same room with them, but you spend time in the same room with someone who spends time in the same room with them. And the three is like, you spend time in the same room as somebody who spends time in the same room as somebody else who spends time in the same room as this person. It's sort of like LinkedIn, if you think about that, except that it's based on who you're actually around. 
Now, what this graph does is it's showing you, for example, let's use some fictitious data on June 23rd that there was nobody that close to you with COVID-19, but there was somebody at nine. Nine is somehow a lot of different relationships. Maybe it's that you go to the same office as someone and that person lives in, uh, in a house with someone else. None of these people have COVID, but if you just keep tracing this chain along nine hops later, you got someone with COVID. Why is this relevant? Well, what, what I'm showing you is the first COVID radar. Uh, I'm not gonna press play. And the purpose of this chart is that it could show you as the days change, June 25th, June 26th, uh, June 27th, June 28th, this is some old data. This is showing that the spread of COVID has started moving towards you. And what's the value of this? I'm just playing it again. The value of this is something which lets every single person basically figure out what is the temperature outside. And this is a, this is a big deal because prior to this kind of an interface, the only thing that a contact tracing app did for you as a person is that it would potentially tell you that it's too late. You already are infected or you are already near someone who has been infected and please stay home so you won't make anyone else hurt. That's the, somehow the idea of contact tracing, which is important, but the idea of contact tracing is to find people who are already sick or poss possibly already sick and asking them to please stay home so you don't get anyone else sick makes perfect sense and we should do it. But if you are trying to make an app that people want to install, it's helpful if the app has something more valuable directly to them as well, other than just potentially telling them that they might have to stay home. And so what I just showed you is the first app for which it has a value to install. The value to install is I'm healthy still, I wanna stay healthy. The way I'll stay healthy is by being able to see as COVID approaches on my network, not because I'll know it was really John Doe who has COVID, but so that I know that it's getting hot in here. Maybe I'm just gonna wear two masks today. <laughs> Maybe I'm just gonna like go to the drive-through. Maybe I'm going to keep nine feet away from everyone else. But why this is important is because this actually then disrupts the spread of COVID. If you think about what this does, this is contact tracing at the other end. And this is where my, my area of research is network theory. And so from the network theory perspective, you can use the network for two things. You can use it for contact tracing, which you still should, Find the, find the cases, isolate the people around them. The other way is with every case, propagate huge information signals to everyone else who's even far away saying, hey, there's one, there's one, we have no idea who it is. But if you see the cloud moving towards you, go ahead and freak out. And that's a good thing. When I say freak out, I don't mean like, you know, cause chaos, I just mean be careful. And if you're careful, if everywhere that COVID goes towards, those people get careful, COVID slows in its spread because it's not able to spread. And so that's just another, another angle in trying, to, in trying to stop the spread of COVID with, 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 uh, with network theory. That was one of our innovations. Actually, the thing about Novid is that Novid brings two innovations at the same time. Uh, both of them are things that you know, uh, could be fairly big deals. The second one is also, it's, it's, it's fun. The second one is one that you can just look at. A show and tell is always fun. So I'm just pulling up the app. And so I, I'm holding up, uh, what is this? I'm holding up an iPhone 5S. It's a, it's a, it's a device from uh, seven years ago. And the other innovation we have is that we have the capability of measuring the exact distance between two devices. Oh, this is pretty good. So I don't know if you can see this. It says two feet, two inches. Can you see that right there? Mm -hmm. It says two feet, two inches. Why it says two feet, two inches is because I was here. And if I reach over for two feet, I can get this other device, which also measures at two feet, two inches. It says in the middle, two feet, two inches. We actually measured the distance between the two devices. Why is this important? Because if you're trying to do any contact tracing or any kind of our early warning system, it's the most critical piece is you got your apps. Can the apps find out where each other are? Well, they need to know how far apart they are. And what I just showed you is a system that uses ultrasound. It's not Bluetooth. Bluetooth is what all the other contact tracing apps use. Ultrasound precisely measured the distance between these two devices uh, using a principle called the speed of sound. Uh, we just see how long it takes for the signal to go from one phone to the other and measure that time, multiply it by the speed of sound, that's the distance. So we have these two things. One is the early warning. The second one is this actual ability to measure distance. And those two, each of them, either of them alone would have made Novid unique but uh, mm -hmm. we've kind of brought both together at the same time. No, Poe, thank you. Um, and that's already um, you know, a, a fascinating set of insights. And um, you know, in, in thinking about how this really differentiates uh, Novid from the 
slew of other contact tracing apps and technologies that we've seen out there. I, I think anyone who's been paying attention to the headlines or to uh, the kinds of reports and publications from different trade associations, um, you know, COVID task forces, those kinds of things, um, we probably saw in March and early April a wave of contact tracing apps that were being developed and rolled out all around the world. And then probably a month after, just a kind of slew of bad press talking about how these things don't actually work, how you need to get to a, a 70, 80, 90 percent um, adoption rate in a population for it to actually work, or just how privacy um, and, and safety um, uh, uh, invasive yeah, how privacy invasive um, these these apps were, especially many of the uh, nationally mandated ones like in India and China. Um, can you just talk a bit about uh, how it is that Novid through these novel um, solutions, these pieces of your secret sauce, uh, get around those fatal flaws? Right. I would say that the first piece is privacy. And that was a critical piece for us that we cared deeply about because at the beginning we said, can we make an app that the average person would want to install? This is how you think if you come from the Carnegie Mellon school uh, and there are designers around, right? You want to make something that matches the user experience that the average person actually wants. And notice I didn't say, can we make an app that we can sell to a government? That wasn't the goal. And since I have no such goal, it was not going to be useful for us to have any feature that would require top-down forcing in order to go through. Now, once you realize you want to have average people want to be part of this, you got to make sure that it's private, right? Because the average person has to say, oh, come on, free. Everything that's free isn't really free. It gets my name, it gets my web browsing history or whatever. It's not free, right? So what we said is, let's make it clear. When you install Novid, and you have, any of you who have noticed that it doesn't ask you for your name, doesn't ask you for your phone number, it doesn't ask you for a username, doesn't ask you for an email address. It actually doesn't even use your GPS information. So all of these things made it so that we don't have the same problems as some other apps, for example, which their foundation is based on GPS. And that's actually worth saying. It's because why did I demonstrate this ultrasound thing? The reason is because I'm able to find out how far apart two different devices are just by making one make a noise at the other. One way that other apps tried to do this before is they tried to say, let's just go and find the GPS coordinates where you are and find the GPS coordinates where the other person is. And it's a standard math problem from geometry class with the coordinates, find out how far apart these two things are. But then that's entirely that's baked into the core of those other apps is the GPS coordinates. The reason we refuse to, do, to use GPS coordinates is because if you knew my GPS coordinates at 3 a.m., you would basically know who I am. It's either me, my wife, or my three kids. It's like it's in our house. You know what I mean? So that's why we didn't allow that. So that's how we made sure the privacy is, is not an issue. And that's also how we evaded the second round of this bad press of things not working. If you ask then why, why was there this slew of apps and why did they all use a different method, I wouldn't blame anyone. I would actually say that the credit goes to the innovators in Singapore. They made an app called Trace Together. I would say that they, those were pioneers in the space and they happened to use Bluetooth. The problem is I think a lot of people after that just assumed that the thing would work and then they all started building their Bluetooth apps. And I, I don't want to say it's easy to build a Bluetooth app, but if you want to use a, make a Bluetooth app, you can call things inside the operating system when you're programming that give you Bluetooth information and Bluetooth signal strength and you can just get them. You don't need to make anything new. You just, well, it's not, that's not quite fair. You have to put all the pieces together, but there are pieces. Why was ours not easy? The reason ours is not easy is that there's no function you can call built into the operating system called make ultrasonic noise and determine how far away the other thing is. It actually doesn't exist. And in fact, also the thing I told you is a little bit, well, it's not a little bit, it's way oversimplified. The idea that one of them makes a noise like beep, and then the other one tries to figure out when the beep showed up. Here's why it's not easy. The beep that I just made is about 200 milliseconds long, maybe, maybe 100 milliseconds long. And if I said, well, when did it arrive? It arrived somewhere in the middle of the beep, plus or minus 50 milliseconds. Sound travels at one foot every millisecond. So if I told you that, I'd be able to tell you how far apart these two devices are, up to plus or minus 50 feet, which is completely useless for contact tracing. And what you just saw is I had like a two feet, however many inches, right? And so that, what I'm saying is that we actually just use different tech. It is sad though that nobody wanted mm -hmm. to cover us. So unfortunately, all the people who were covering the news 
only wanted to cover the big players, whatever they define big to be. Uh, big sometimes mm -hmm. is whoever has a good PR team. Uh, and we, we were just coming up with good tech. And unfortunately, at the beginning, nobody wanted to cover anything that wasn't coming out of the big players, which is sad. Mm -hmm. And that's why we hope that, you know, as we're, as we're talking about this here in our, in our own group here, if people do spend the time to go and dig and find out mm -hmm. for themselves that this is a serious solution, uh, what we need is that smart people like you say something about it. And then the rest sure. of the world will find out that there's a difference. So Poe, that, that leads us really well into um, some questions that we're getting from, from the audience. And you know, first of all, I think it's, it's really exciting. You know, back towards the end of June, um, you had already published some you know, technical reports and, and documents about the level of uh, accuracy that you were getting. Um, you know, uh, one statistic being 99.6 of, uh, um, of cases that you were measuring um, being accurate in terms of uh, not getting false positives for phones that were more than nine feet away. So, you know, having some kind of margin of error for not getting the false positives that you get for just about all other Bluetooth only apps. So that's already really great. And I, I know that it's on the front page of your, um, you know, Novid website. Uh, but can you tell us about, you know, what the kind of adoption and usage of Novid looks like right now and what it's ready for in terms of schools, organizations, universities, you know, uh, government officials or other organizations that might want to deploy Novid, um, given the fact that even to this date, there um, are few, if any, um, uh, endorsed or available um, apps that have been shown to be effective within the US. Right, right, right. So actually, the, our, our life right now is a little bit nuts because we're being contacted by tons and tons and tons of universities and schools which are trying to figure out what to do next year because they've mm -hmm. discovered that there is exactly one anonymous contact tracing app available for the United States, and that's called Novid. Mm -hmm. uh, and now the, the question is about adoption, right? Um, now, first, I want to emphasize that our adoption requirements for Novid are also lower than all the adoption requirements that you've heard from any, any other app. That's interesting. And the reason is it's easily described like this. Pretend that there is a pack of wolves coming at you at night. And let's just, let's just say coming at you. There's a pack of wolves roaming around, a pack of 100 wolves. Now, imagine that you have only the capability to see up to 10 feet. That's the, the range of your detection. Suppose you only can see up to 10 feet. Then you really hope that whenever a wolf shows up next to 10 feet of you, you have a very high chance of detecting them. Does that sort of make sense? You better, you better detect them because you only can see 10 feet. And if you don't detect it, you're dead. Now, that's what happens when you don't have the benefit of the anonymous network. Like I showed you that red chart at the beginning, showing this wolf pack coming towards you. We give the early warning. Uh, the other systems that people came up with were not using network theory. So they only would tell you somebody right next to you, not right next to you, but somebody that you spend time with tested positive. That's the equivalent of wolf within 10 feet. And then you better really get, you better really know. If you don't know, it's too late. You know what I mean? That's why they care so much about high, high, high accuracy. It's ironic because we have high accuracy, but I'm about to tell you why the early warning network even makes it so you don't. That's why we have two of those innovations. But the second piece, what this early warning network is about, now suppose you can see more than 10 feet. You can see a mile. But suppose that you can only detect 10% of wolves. But there are 100 wolves. It's okay. The wolves, the wolves are in a pack. Do you know what I mean? There's this pack of 100 wolves coming at you, and you can detect 10% of them. And you can see them a mile away. So you see a blob of 10 wolves coming at you from like 500 meters or, or you know, a quarter mile or something like that. And you say, I think I'm going to go the other way. That's the power of the early warning system. And once you contrast it in that way, it's extremely clear that you have a huge benefit from this network. And that's also why we don't need a huge adoption. Because in order for that early network to be, early warning network to be useful, you just need a network. And now this becomes a user experience problem. How to let people know that they are part of something big. Every time someone downloads an app, they want to know, am I the only person using this? So the way we did this is, um, this is already true on the iPhone. The Android version of this is about to drop, about to release in about a day or two. But the Android, but, but whatever it is, it's, it will tell you, here's how many people are in your network at each distance. Not how many wolves, not how many positives, but how many people. So you get an idea of what you're in. And if you want this to have value, you really just need that you, have at least two people that you spend time in the same room as over a course of two weeks, that's how our system works, who have the app installed. And each of those two people needs to have at least two other people 
who they spend a lot of time with in the same room as, with app installed, and so on and so on. And if that's the case, your chart is already going to show that you've got signal. You're part of a big community because of this exponential explosion. And I calculated that you know, a typical person in the course of two weeks does spend time in the same room as about like 10 to 20 people. So you really only need about a 10% install rate among the people you hang around before you feel like it's got value because you, you get to see this network and occasionally you see those wolves coming. But once that has value, here's, the, here's how this works. Once you get to that 10%, then people around you look at the app and say, wait a second, you got an app that tells you where the COVID is? I want one. You see, that's where the user experience comes in. It's that, oh, actually, there's, there's an immediate value to a healthy person to install the app. So suddenly, other people start to join because they just want to protect themselves. Suddenly, your 10% that installed becomes 20% that installed for free. And then that becomes 30%. And the whole thing snowballs. This is why it's so different from making an app for which people say, well, you know, in order to really protect yourself against the wolf, we need like 60% of the people. So that, that's, that's, the, that's how this whole thought process works. It's basically network theory. You asked me some other questions, but I went off on a tangent on this one. So I might have to answer you. No, no, that, that, no it's, it's, it's so good, uh, Poe, because, um, you know, I think that kind of adoption barrier and, you know, the, the floor for where it can actually be useful for people is such a great, um, uh, you know, such a great point here and makes it so much more usable. Um, in addition to the fact that it's, it's clear how much Novid has invested in terms of the actual user experience design, where I've seen um, several other apps that look like, um, you know, who knows how good the functionality are, but they're just so hard to navigate and use. They, they look like they were uh, created in a weekend hackathon or, or something like that. Um, and so, so those pieces are great. Um, but I'd, I'd love for you to talk um, a bit more about uh, some of perhaps like the, the personal or the community-based adoption barriers to um, some of these solutions. Uh, especially in cases where people have been um, historically and culturally uh, driven to really be skeptical of um, these kinds of technology um, and where that trust for how the, um, how the technology is used, what data it's gathering, and um, all of that can really be hard to earn. Um, we got a question from Ron Yoder about um, a question from the principal of his school uh, regarding whether or not you, know, you think that having people install the app might increase the angst or the worry of students in, in school regarding COVID-19, whether it's because I can imagine um, it could be partially because of the individual mandates of that or just being equipped with the knowledge of how COVID is around them. And he notes that the school um, is 91% based on a Spanish heritage high school with 2,200 plus students. Um, so could you speak a bit to that? Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks, thanks Ron, for asking that question. Um, I would say that definitely having knowledge that COVID-19 is roaming in the community would probably make people more aware of it. But I consider that to be a good thing. Actually, if I look at the statistics even in Pittsburgh, it seems that somehow we unfortunately here in Pittsburgh recently saw a big spike. And just judging from the behaviors that I can see as I'm driving home, I, I live in the middle of, I, I work in the middle of Oakland, a neighborhood in Pittsburgh, which you, some of you know is full of um, relatively uh, young people who, uh, who, are, who, are, who are college students. And, and you can just see when people think that there's no issue, I basically could see a few weeks behind, a few weeks earlier, I could see that there's gonna be something that's gonna blow up. Right. And so what you actually probably want is you probably want to, in addition to giving information, you want to teach people how to interpret that information. Information is truth. It's like this. It's like if I'm driving a car, I would like to be able to see that there are cars coming along the opposite lane from me, only about five feet away from me at 50 miles an hour. Maybe, maybe there's a median, let's say, for, let's say 35 miles an hour, right? I would like to know that I'm going at 35 miles an hour and there's another car coming at me 35 miles an hour and it's only five feet away when it passes. By the way, that's really scary once you think about it because that's a net difference of 70 miles per hour, but somehow we're okay. I'd rather, by the way, I'd rather see that car than not see that car. So my point is we just want to make sure that our society is able to interpret information 
Uh, that's why, I guess, that's why I really care about education and teaching mathematics and teaching science. This graph right here, really, if there's something at 12, that's really far from you. If you go and do the math of it, the incubation period of COVID is such that if you're, you're, you're well over a week, you're, you're several weeks away from getting infected at that 12. On the other hand, if you actually see it going from 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, you would want everyone in that community to buckle up and try to figure out what to do to be careful. Because what that is doing, what the app is doing, is it's helping to prevent a Houston. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the point is that this is, this, my, my attitude is just, there's information. My job is to, prevent, pre, is to present the most accurate information possible. And then we hope that we can teach people how to interpret the information. And by doing so, everyone will be able to make better decisions for themselves. Perfect. Um, and Poe, you mentioned that your inbox is flooded right now with inquiries from universities, companies, other organizations. Um, and I imagine you're continuing to iterate and adapt uh, the app to fit those different kinds of needs and environments, use cases. Uh, for, say, administrators of a school or anybody looking to deploy Novid within some kind of environment, um, what are the kinds of insights that they can glean from uh, that kind of network data if there isn't you know, personally identifiable information and, and that kind of stuff? Are there dashboards or other kinds of um, info that might be made available to um, an organization using this that's different from an individual user? Yeah, thanks very much for asking. I mean, one thing that we discovered after we came up with our technology is that we discovered that there are people trying to commercialize something very similar to it, where they would be tracking people by their ID. And in fact, they were trying to sell, many, many, many of these were attempting to sell such a product to employers. Actually, some of them approached us asking if we would uh, work with them and you know, license our technology or work with, or become part of them. I said, no, that's not what this was designed for. Right, so somehow that's a, that's a funny thing. Like we happen to come up with these ideas, but if you come up with the ideas, you can decide what they're used for. And we said, no, we're not interested in any of, in any of, these, uh, any of these things. It kind of is scary to us, the notion that you could use this technology to go and trace that this really was Jane Doe, who's working at this, at this particular company, and Jane Doe spent time with John Smith. I don't think it's important to know it's Jane Doe or John Smith. At that point, when we're talking about community adoption, say in a school or in a university, what we noticed is that early on in the pandemic, early, early on, people thought that was, that then they were not interested in what we were doing because they said, well, I, I really want to know who it is and where, where that person is. That's where the journalists did do something useful. Journalists in America got everyone very alarmed about the idea that your employer might one day tell you, you must install this app, which lets the employer track you by name and you should somehow be concerned about this. I'm very happy that happened. Because now when we talk to people, people, uh, people seem to understand, like the institutions seem to understand that maybe it's not quite acceptable to know every single thing about every single person. And at that point, now they're interested because what we can do for an institution is we do care about anonymity. What, the, what, ha what can happen is a person can voluntarily put um, a code in, meaning that they want to join this community uh, represented by that institution. And there'll be a thousand people, 10,000 people in that community. And then the aggregated information can be seen by that community manager. But the important thing is, at the very beginning, the information was still anonymous to begin with. And so what this does is it sort of solves two problems. Uh, on the one hand, it protects all of the anonymity. On the other hand, if you think about what the organization is trying to do, it might not really matter that it's John Doe. Maybe what matters to the organization is just how many people are sick, how close is COVID getting to the front doors of the organization. These kinds of pieces of information are useful. And so effectively, we're able to use the anonymous network we have to compute this sort of aggregate statistics, which can be useful for making a decision without exposing who anyone is. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, I've got a couple more questions, and then I am going to bring Mara back in um, to, to join our, our conversation, the Q&A. Um, but, but first, um, you know, there's a good question about, uh, you know, does the app update as the affected people recover? And can you also just talk about um, the, um, the kind of confirmation process for somebody to register themselves as having been infected by COVID um, and how that can be verified to reduce the chances of like bad actors or, or false positives? Sure. So I think the first thing I want to make clear is that 
Here's something that our app does not do, which many people think that a contact tracing app does. This does not happen. It is if you say I'm positive, and then you start walking around at Walmart, and then everyone's like, oh my gosh, there's someone positive here. This our app does not do. Actually, the way our app works is that when you report positive, at that moment, you appear on that chart. Not you, but the, the, a little, an extra plus one appears on that chart of everyone saying, hey, there was a new signal of positive at some distance. That's the only time. Now, after that, if you walk around, even though you're positive, nobody is told anything. That's for privacy reasons. Now, you might say, hang on a second, shouldn't we be going and reporting all these people? Then I'd say, my job was not to make a house arrest app. The, some, some, some countries are making house arrest apps whose goal is to keep you quarantined when you're supposed to be quarantined. That is not my job. So, so I have no interest in doing that. Therefore, all I can say is if you mark yourself positive, you know, please be considerate of other people and don't do that. But it's not my, not, we're not going to be enforcing that. Instead, what happens is you know, your signal has been sent. But the reason why it's enough to have sent this signal is that the main, the main value proposition, the value add of this app for the average user is to watch the wave of wolves, like the wave of positive tests getting closer to them. So you've already contributed your signal saying that, hey, you know, I unfortunately got positive. And the next signal that gets closer to that other person is not going to be you anyway. It'll be somebody else who got sick. So you've done your job. So that's, that's the one thing. Now, does our app update if other affected people recover? Yeah, we're actually building that in as a user interface element just because it seems to make sense. But the important piece was just about somehow, uh, it, it is not that kind of a privacy unconscious app that, that will just tell people mm -hmm. when they're around. And the Excellent. next piece was how, do, this is an important one though, you asked, how mm -hmm. do you actually report positive? We've got two ways. One way is that you just press the button, but that's just called a self-report. I mean, you take that with a grain of salt or a tablespoon of salt. The other thing we're trying to do is we're, trying, we're, we're looking to work together with, for example, the, we'd love to work with the Allegheny County Health Department. We're trying, to con, we're trying to contact people. We're trying to contact people who are involved in making the tests. We have a way to, make, to anonymously confirm tests by which we would work with, for example, the health department. We'd give the health department a way to get tickets from us. Tickets are one-time use, little tickets that anyone using the app can enter into their app to be able to lodge a confirmed positive test. This would add an enormous amount of value. And so, for example, if the Allegheny County Health Department wanted to work with us, like tomorrow or the next day, we could have something set up mm -hmm. where every single positive test is able to authenticate through Novid. And for example, if people in the county installed the app, everyone would get this radar. And then you'd just be able, to, I actually think that would drive down the cases like crazy. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a really good um, segue into what was my last question, though. Um, there's definitely more that are coming in through the, the chat um, that, you know, uh, yeah, Mara can also join in on um, responding to, which is essentially, um, you know, looking forward as, as you continue to develop and refine these solutions, um, work with different organizations, uh, what are your biggest needs or your hopes for your upcoming goals and, and development. Uh, you mentioned the Allegheny County Health Department. Um, you know, are there other kind of dream collaborators or, or partners that you're looking for? And um, you know, I also understand that you've got some strategic hires that you're looking to fill as well. Um, yeah, just tell us about how we can help you as a community. Sure, thank you so much. I mean, first of all, I'm very happy to be in Pittsburgh, which is a city where uh, you, you made a comment where somehow the distance is two. Everybody knows somebody. There's somebody in common that you'll know whenever you're trying to connect, whenever you're trying to connect. I think that this is very valuable. And I also think that this represents an opportunity for Pittsburgh. Actually, I'll say that something that would help us a lot in gaining national adoption is that a lot, a lot of people outside Pittsburgh ask, hey, what does Pittsburgh think? Right? And, and so in some sense, you know, if we, if we just got together on this, we might be able to have an explosive impact. In fact, there are some national journalists who we have talked to who said, you know, if you actually get a city or a county using this thing, we'll, we'll cover you. By the way, these are the same journalists who go and cover other people's not working apps. And, and, and then in the end, you just get articles saying apps don't work. But what we're looking for, honestly, is to be able to work together with the health department, with the city, with the county, and what we are trying to do is just solve a problem. And we, we, we've actually been approaching for a while. Uh, we, and, and if any of you on this call know somebody for us to talk to, I'd love to. 
And what, what we just want to do is to make an impact. And why it would be great to do it here is because we are here. This is where I live. This is where our team lives. And if we live here, first of all, we've got a lot of skin in the game because we would like to not get sick. <laughs> right? there's, a, there's, a certain, there's a certain thing here, which is called, um, if we do something here, we are healthier. Uh, and and, and that's, that's great. And also we have the opportunity to work closely enough that we'd understand the real situation. So that's one piece. And of course, there are other things. If you happen to be listening from outside Pittsburgh, or if you're in Pittsburgh and have national connections, obviously the other thing we are looking for is more national, national level acknowledgement from thought leaders that something amazing has actually come out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, that there's mm -hmm. somehow, you know, there are trillion dollar companies, national governments, which have tried to solve a problem. And then somehow there's some little group here involved <laughs> with Carnegie Mellon University and some other people in Pittsburgh, including the guy who made the Pat Track app, the bus track app. He's actually one of our, one of our team members, mm -hmm. but his name is Jeremy Zhao. But so, so we, you know, with, with this group of people, we have made something that currently is the most functional in the entire world. And what we need is for more people outside to mention. Last thing, Kenny, Kenny you did mention, we are looking for strategic hires also, just mainly in the re for the reason that uh, our inbox, my inbox today has gone nuts. And so what, what we're also looking for is people, if there are any people here, or if you know any people who are particularly good at customer service and or sales, right? I mean, this is basically sales in the sense that we're trying to convince many, many, many people to go and join this. And there are a lot of interpersonal communications to do. And also we at this point need to be able to support any universities that decide to join us. The infrastructure we built is actually pretty good. It's already been specced to handle millions of people. That's not a problem. But every single additional university to us has their own custom questions. And so we're actually looking for engineers, backend engineers, Android developers, iOS developers. Honestly, when the reason is because we have made this solution here, which is at this point world leading. So this is also an opportunity now to make the center of operating this world leading innovation actually here. This could create a whole ton of jobs, to be perfectly honest, because it just mm -hmm. happens to be a, like a double technological breakthrough. Awesome. Um, yeah, uh, Mara, um, I'm going to invite you to yeah. uh, jump back in. I think this is um, you know, exactly the reason why we're having this kind of conversation. You know, uh, Poe um, and his team have brought Novid uh, all the way to where they're at, you know, being the number one most functional uh, contact tracing app, um, you know, in, in the country and in, in the world. Um, uh, through grit and a lot of resourcefulness, you know, from, from their end, despite being a, a small team. And, you know, I think a lot of the ethos of liftoff and the work of the JHF and the community here is here to help elevate and, um, and support that kind of innovation. So, um, you know, I'm excited that we're all here together. Yeah. And I think, you know, thank you again, Poe and, and Kenny, I think you are both um, absolute exemplars of, of the type of talent that we're trying to cultivate and support with liftoff. Um, so, Poe, my question to you, um, you know, coming from the perspective of liftoff, trying to to support the innovation ecosystem and grow it, is where do we go now? Where do we go from here after COVID? Um, when we we will get through it, I, I know we will. Um, we'll get through it because of ingenuity, like like Novid and you and your team, but. But what do, where do we go? Where do we go? Where do we go after? Right. I think that there's something that COVID has done. And now this is going way beyond education. Sorry, this is going way beyond just healthcare, right? So, I mean, definitely on the healthcare front, there are going to be a lot of innovations. For example, we're now finding out ways to use smartphones to do things. We're finding ways to decentralize, uh, and to even do remote remote health in some sense, telehealth, uh, telemedicine, I guess that's what it's called. So I see a lot of tele everything as becoming something that has developed immensely. I think there's something else that we'll also have had to try to figure out, which is some forms of using, on, uh, using internet with regard to education, with regard to remote collaboration. I was just talking to some of our team members who work on other parts of the social enterprise I run, and we were, we were thinking, how long should, should we really make this? We're, we're hiring for the other part where I make educational lessons. And we were saying, should we make it a remote position? And the answer was, well, yeah, we have no idea when it's not going to be a remote position. And the people are always asking, does it matter that we're hiring somebody who's in Pittsburgh or should we just hire someone outside? You know, even this question that came, that's a new one. 
although I'll tell you the answer that I gave when we discussed someone in Pittsburgh versus someone outside, I said, well, to be honest, there is something special about being able to collaborate once in a while. So our decision ended up being, mm, let's, stay with, let's stay with hiring in Pittsburgh, build our team here. But uh, with regard to everything else, even living in Pittsburgh, what, what does the workplace look like? What does the office look like? I think those are questions we'll ask. Another thing I think that we will now also know as an entire human race is that this can happen again. And the next time this happens, we shouldn't do it this way. So, so what I mean is that uh, at the beginning, we just saw complete chaos and it's not, I'm not blaming anyone. You can't predict what a pandemic is. But at the same time, there were no technological tools and so there was no way to control the spread. One goal I have is that we'll, we'll, we'll nail this Novid thing, but the next time a pandemic shows up, everyone should just go pop on their Novid like on, on like week one. And if that happens, you'll squash the entire pandemic. It'll be over. Because everyone will see these wolves coming and everyone says, no, 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 I saw that last time. But by the way, that's, that, that's now putting the United States in the same position that some of the Asian countries were in. Some people ask, why were the Asian countries successful in handling COVID? It's because they got attacked by the first SARS, right? And so there, there, are, there are lessons. Like some people say in Taiwan, Taiwan was very successful, but that's because Taiwan remembered what happened last time. And so what I think is important, especially since many people on this, on this meeting are from the health industry, well, we need to know what to do next time so that we won't have to all lock down. Well, I'm glad to hear that, that you're going to hire uh, Pittsburghers and continue to grow your team here. Uh, that's wonderful news. And, and so what is your advice to other, um, whether they're researchers, academics, you know, uh, entrepreneurs, what is, what is your advice uh, to them about jumping in right now and, and in the near future to contribute and to move us forward? What would you say? Right. So I should say I'm not really a professional in the making money side. So so that so far we haven't um we haven't really done that. So, but in any case, we're lucky enough that right now we're supported by philanthropy, actually. So, so I, what I should say is that I'm not entirely sure what I'd say to the entrepreneur who's trying to start a business doing this. Um, the reason I say that is because it's unclear to me how you can make money that fast if you wanted to make a startup that was trying to do something COVID related. And by the time you've got up to speed, it might be too late because COVID will hopefully be over thanks to the work the rest of us are trying to do. So that one, I don't know. I don't know about the entrepreneurs. On the other hand, what I should say is that if, for example, you're entrepreneurially minded and you see a project which is taking off, yes, you might not get rich, but Actually, what we have always been doing is for what we're doing here with Novid, we're hiring entrepreneurially minded people. Uh, unfortunately, you can't necessarily get rich, but at least you have done something valuable. And also it's a job at this moment where jobs are a little bit, uh, a little bit scarce. But in any case, I should say that the mindset of building something is very important. And I love the entrepreneurial mindset. In fact, every single person I try to hire for these positions, you got to have it. It's, like, it's, a, it's a must have. And the reason it's a must have is because you can't use the same method we used before. It's a different world. And that's, that's why the way Novid works is that we just keep innovating. We won't do anything the old way. And because we don't do anything the old way, we find new ways. If you happen to be in the research side, I think that at this point, there are a lot of incentives to do research related to COVID-19. But I think I'll share as a researcher who did make that jump. As I said, I'm a mathematician. I work in a math department and normally people don't associate math department with making, making like this kind of an app. But I'd say I've noticed actually many people in my department, even though I said that, actually there are many people in my department who have started to use their ideas to think about modeling or other things. This is actually a, a rare moment where if you want to try something a little bit outside your area of normal research, nobody is going to blame you for thinking about COVID. You know what I mean? <laughs> like if you just said, I felt like thinking about some biology now, even though I happen to be a computer scientist because COVID. Yeah, go for it. I think that makes sense. Absolutely. Kenny, is anything uh, popping up that you wanted to mention? I think um, I, I, I muted myself. Uh, no, no, uh, you know, really, I think, um, in, in a lot of the innovation communities, um, whether it's in Pittsburgh or in partner cities and other places um, around the country or, or globally, I, I feel like there's a lot of the companies and organizations that have um, come and, and gone, um, some have persisted, some have left when it comes to trying to find direct solutions to the COVID uh, crisis as it stands. Um, and 
a lot of that's really necessary. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a numbers game in terms of vaccine development and other treatments. You know, uh, we, we need that kind of healthy competition between uh, solutions and bring that ingenuity together to find the one that actually works. Um, but I think you know, going forward, a, a lot of people um, talk about how COVID has ex essentially accelerated the pace and the necessity of change and innovation and um, in many ways, especially in certain industries, um, compacted 10 years worth of change and disruption within the scope of about 10 weeks. Um, you know, retail is never going to be the same. Um, Education has been changed forever. Um, you know, a lot of um, uh, places like the, the uh, meat uh, packing and food processing industries and places where people work in close quarters, um, a lot of that becoming untenable because of these public health risks means that there's a wide mandate for all of us to look across the board and, you know, not rest on our laurels um, and wait to have another kind of uh, tragedy or crisis, um, you know, create this kind of negative impact again. So, um, you know, I think outside of the scope of direct response, um, there is currently a necessity, not just an opportunity for um, entrepreneurs to think of better solutions uh, to, to go forth and, you know, hopefully people are, are responsive to it. And I, and I love what you said, Poe. I think we think entrepreneurship, we always think entrepreneur equals moneymaker. And, and I disagree. I think we should think of it the way that you do. I think someone should be entrepreneurially minded. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they are out for profit, but they are thinking in that, in that manner. So I love that. We just got a question, which was sort of, a, sort of something I was going to ask you, but what kinds of performance metrics do you envision for gouging uh, Novid's community's effectiveness? community effectiveness. And so, you know, and my question was, how will you know that you've succeeded with, with Novid? When, when will you feel good about what you've done uh, with, this, with this app? To be honest, I think the way that I would, if I was trying to gauge the effectiveness, I think I would do this. I would say, we sort of know what happens in the community if you didn't have Novid, because we're watching that right now. We're seeing what happens in Houston. We're seeing what happens even here in Pittsburgh. And we know the speed at which things grow. To me, with Novid, we're actually trying to reduce the speed of, of virus growth very substantially. And so one thing that I would use first is I would be curious to what degree people get concerned about that wave of red coming towards them. Um, if actually people do get concerned when the wave of red approaches them, I think that will already be uh, a fairly good effectiveness. Because by the way, at that point, you've done something which is more general. You've just managed to enforce the mask order. Uh, I mean, I, I'm basically saying, uh, but by the way, it's not that I'm, I'm saying it's half of a joke, but at the same time, you know, people sometimes don't want to have the idea that I have to wear a mask for two years, right? Like if you just told someone, you're just going to have to act at absolute maximum vigilance for the next two years until the vaccine is rolled out to everyone, some people will say, forget it, I'm going to give up. And so, so what we're looking for is, first of all, are people able to modulate their behavior based on this? Okay, that's a, that's a short-term thing. The long-term thing, not the long-term thing, the big goal, the big goal is that you'd actually just see less transmission. And if there's less transmission, then I would say this has been massively successful. I don't necessarily, there'll be, I don't necessarily know if there'll be greater freedom of movement. It's more that this shut down, open up, shut down, open up will probably happen in a more smooth way. And it might even happen neighborhood by neighborhood. That's actually what I'd anticipate happening, or not necessarily neighborhood, but like community by community. Some communities are getting hot, they'll act a bit more careful. Some communities are cool, they'll be a little bit more loose. Then you notice that it's getting hot, and then those communities become careful again. My analogy is it's like driving. The way I drive is that I don't drive exactly in the middle of the lane. I don't think I can. But if I see myself getting too close to the left side, I move the steering wheel and go a bit right. And I'm getting a bit too close to the right side, so I turn the steering wheel to go left. You just need to show people how to steer. And that's actually where I feel that Novid adds the value. Absolutely. So I'm going to ask the final question. Poe, you are an absolute joy to talk to. And Kenny, thank you so much for being with us. So my question, Poe, is you have an absolutely contagious energy that I know every, anyone who, is, who speaks to you says that, that you are very upbeat, you are very positive. So how, how do you sort of maintain that during what, you know, many will say is going to be one of the hardest times of any of our lives? And and sort of, 
you know, how, how do you maintain that, that positive attitude? So here, honestly, the reason is because I see that the United States is legitimately in a crisis. This is a legitimate crisis. I also do not see any other potential solution that could do anything to reverse the crisis now. I don't see any. In Texas, they're already trying to enforce the mask order. What are you going to do? You further enforce the mask order? The, the, the mask can go so far, but you actually also need information. So what I'm saying is, I actually just don't see any other, pro I don't even know of any other project which could potentially release an innovation tomorrow that could attempt to turn things around. And if I don't see anything else, but we actually know that ours could, if we just made the right partnerships, I'm not talking about technological innovation, I'm talking about non-technological barriers. If we could make the right partnerships, then it would work. Well, then I have to do it. That's, that's actually how I feel. It's like, remember how I got into this whole thing. I'm a guy who does math and education. Why in the world am I doing this? Well, it's because the whole goal I was called to was like, stop COVID-19. And so as long as it happens to be that I see that what we are doing is the only solution I can even think of that I know anyone is working on that could help stop this today, then I have to do it. That's it. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, some folks are asking about information on jobs and more about Novid. I would direct them to your website. Is yes. that? Uh, yeah, if you just go to novid.org. If you go to novid.org, you'll find some way to email us. Send us an email. Uh, okay. We will, we will, we'll make sure that somebody reads it. <laughs> Fabulous. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Poe. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you for everyone uh, who, was, who has joined us tonight. Our next uh, event in our speaker series will be looking at inclusive innovation and addressing disparities. Uh, I would direct you to our website, liftoffpgh.org, to check that out, a little bit more information about our speakers. And um, you can register there. Uh, again, also always follow us on social media, interact with us, get involved. We, you know, it, it's an open and wide tent. Liftoff is all about collaboration and engaging our community uh, in looking towards the future. So thank you again for being with us and everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank Good you, night. Mara. Thank you, JHL.